Well, good morning and welcome uh, to our service this morning. It is uh, very good to see you today uh, on a rather wet and very wintry day, but nevertheless, it's very nice to see you. And a welcome to uh, those who will be listening to this service on, on the website and indeed uh, on YouTube. Uh, I want to give them uh, all and to you here a very special welcome today. Our theme for the service is National Giving Day. Uh, our call to worship is taken from Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Then our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. And so with that in our minds, let us indeed come and worship God as we sing our opening hymn, 130, Ye Servants of God. before God in prayer. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, it is good to come into your presence to offer you our adoration and our praise. In your presence, we are reminded of all your goodness and of your mercy to us. You have given us the gift of life to use it wisely and in an honoring way to you. You have blessed us with homes and families and friends. You have given order to the created universe. 
through the beauty of your ever-changing seasons. We marvel at all the good things you have granted your children, and yet none can compare with the supreme gift of Jesus, your Son, our Saviour. Daily we marvel at the miracle of his birth into our world. Daily we rejoice at the wisdom of his words, the humility of his life, the perfection of his example. Help us today at all times to consider the suffering he endured for our sake upon the cross. Let us never forget that our lives were bought at a price and are precious in your sight. Let us never forget that you love us and you care for us and work only for our well-being through trials and tribulations, through the many challenges of life, every moment, every second, you are there by our side. May we know in our hearts that we are never alone and never without a friend. For you are always with us, even in times of trouble, in times of testing or times of doubt. And so, Father, this morning in faith and with humility, we ask for your forgiveness for those times when we are forgetful of your presence, for those times when we have ignored your truth, and followed our own way, for those times when we have been less loving, less than good, a good example. And so, Lord, we are truly sorry, and we pray that you will fill us again with your Holy Spirit and bring us to the companionship of Jesus until your thoughts become our thoughts and your ways become our ways. Bless us now as we present ourselves to be used in your service. May everything that we do, everything that we hear, everything that we say be done all to the glory of your name. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord, who in his words we further pray saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And so at this time, I'm, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Alistair Shaw, who is our treasurer. I know that he is, is, is also looking after the sound as well, so he's, he's in high demand this morning. But uh, we are looking forward to what he has to say. Yes, uh, thank you, Benjamin. Um, Benjamin almost has stolen my first line, because what I was going to say was for uh, those listening at home, the slight delay was because I've just moved forward from the audio controls. But then, isn't it unfortunate? Thank you. Mask off. Is that better or will I put it back on again? (laughs) Um, But for all of us, isn't it good that there's a sound man as your treasurer? (laughs) However, the events this morning are much more serious than silly little jokes. Uh, National Giving Day is a Church of Scotland promoted exercise asking all members to think about their giving. Uh, the date's extended from 5th September to today, and today in Burgary Parish Church we have our giving day. We are asked to consider all aspects of our contribution to the welfare of the church. Now in Burgary Parish, Parish Church we're fortunate. We have a generous congregation who contribute, whose contributions are the highest in the presbytery. This means that we not only support ourselves, but we also contribute to the Church of Scotland centrally 
and through the central organisation, we help with the wider work of the church, including support, uh, supporting congregations less fortunate than ourselves. Our listed membership, you might be surprised to learn, is actually over 600. Of course, many rarely, if ever, attend, but we have among this group uh, some people who are very generous contributors, and that's something we perhaps don't want to entirely overlook. Thinking now of our regulars, approximately 31 households donate half our income and approximately 38 households donate 60% of our income. Why do I report this? I want to acknowledge the generosity of these people, but there's a but, and a big but. I'm sure some who donate lesser sums may well be making more sacrifice. So to those whose contribution is much less, but makes a real impact on their spending, I say, an even bigger thank you than I do to those who have already been generous. But it does behove each one of us to review our givings. I appreciate that might mean for some that with regret they have to make reductions. But some, perhaps even many of us, might just manage to give a little more. As you may be aware, we face big repair costs. You'll have noticed the scaffolding outside. Once these are complete, we must consider making our sanctuary more up-to-date. That might involve different seating, and I appreciate that would be controversial, but less, less controversial would be updating our audio system and adding video. <clears throat> the current video system, based as it is on magnificent balancing acts, as you can see to my right and left, uh, require consideration. The current video system is really not fit for purpose. So our expenditure will increase. We're currently drawing on reserves, but that can't go on indefinitely. Of course, financial contributions are not all that mattered. Time donated to church works, be that gardening, organising building works, arranging hall letting, cajoling the boilers, serving teas and coffee, uh, adhering to all the various COVID rules, and I pay tribute, and I'm sure we all would, to Clifford here and the huge amount of work he's done there. All these help our finances. Now, I'm going to embarrass someone now, because in this regard, our star performer, who works tirelessly for no financial reward, is Lexton Lopar, organist. Not only did he and Elspeth contribute, but they contribute, or Lex contributes through his work to the tune, I'm sorry that's not supposed to be another joke, but he contributes to the tune of over £3,000 a year. So people who give of their time, but don't necessarily give money, are making a huge contribution. Over the past couple of years there's been a welcome move to donation by standing order. It's simple, dependable, cost-free. I appreciate it's not to everyone's liking, one member said he would prefer to continue with standing orders, or he would prefer not to move to standing orders, as there'd be a dramatic change in household fortunes if he were to die. But standing orders, of course, can be changed. They're in the control of the person who makes the standing order. So, to that extent, they're risk-free. We've explored more up-to-date methods of giving, but they all come with costs. Now, I've attended Church of Scotland Zoom meetings and presentations about alternative methods, and I've spoken with a Church of Scotland treasurer on the border where they have introduced more modern methods, but so far with very limited success. But please, please, if any of you here or people you're speaking to hear of techniques which are being used successfully by other churches, please, please do let me know. May I return to what I said earlier? Please, please, could we all review our givings? Now, I'll now turn to something, and in case you're getting bored, I've always finished. I'll now turn to something a bit more philosophical. I've been talking about finance, or as the economists would say, capital. But I wonder if you would agree with me that more important than money capital is human capital. We must face the fact of declining activity 
in the Church of Scotland. We feel it here in Blairgarry, and it's felt probably in all congregations and the church centrally. Now last Sunday, we had a Sunday school service with just one child present. And please, no criticism of Isabel and her staff. It's just that modern parents, when they're considering what children will do on a Sunday, don't seem to consider Sunday school. I find this apparent lack of interest odd, for the Christian message surely has never been more relevant as we consider the world's problems, including climate change. In the youth of older members like me, the political issues were one of left or right, free markets or state control. The ideas of Marx had appeal in society, we should contribute according to our abilities and only take according to our needs. And these surely were ideas of, of which Jesus would have approved. But I remember once debating this with an old friend of my wife. She was a minister's widow. She listened carefully, but had a question I couldn't answer. Where, Alistair, she said, have these ideas been implemented? Certainly not in the communist societies or in the so-called people republics, and that's still the case today. So many of us surely will think that it's not so much the system as the practically expressed values of each and every one of us that makes for a good society. But who guides us? Surely it's Christian principles. And yet most of us shy away from promoting our church. We feel a touch embarrassed. Jesse and I recently renewed acquaintance with old friends who have moved away. He was an elder in this very church. Then they moved to Eileth and then further away. I asked if they'd joined the local church, but felt obliged to say they had no need to respond if the question was perceived as awkward. But why was I driven to make that proviso? Why am I inhibited in asking those of our own membership who've not returned since the COVID hit why it is that they've not returned? If we don't promote our own church, who will? Our religious leaders would probably call that discipleship. Management consultants would call it promotion or brand recognition. What would we call it? Is it salesmanship? Enthusiasm? Confidence, perhaps? I wear two hats. Wearing the pessimistic hat, I declare that the Church of Scotland is in terminal decline. Wearing the optimistic one, I say that with renewed vigour and faith, we will survive and prosper. Is my optimistic hat the larger one? Is that the one we will all wear? Thank you. My, a huge thanks to you, Alastair, for sharing a, a very thought-provoking presentation uh, on, on giving, not just of money, but certainly of time and indeed of our resources as we can. So let us uh, hear what he has to say. Let us take it to heart and, and certainly uh, let us be enthusiastic and move on in faith. Uh, as we contribute to the life of our church and indeed encourage one another to serve the Lord and to love him as he certainly deserves to be loved. So we are going to sing a hymn which hopefully will reflect the theme that uh, Alistair has just spoken about, 502, Take My Life and Let It Be.
And now we are going to have the readings and Eleanor is going to come and read the two readings for us this morning. Thank you. Our first reading is Psalm 127 and you'll find that around page 618 in the Pew Bibles. In praise of God's goodness. If the Lord does not build the house, the work of the builders is useless. If the Lord does not protect the city, it is useless for the sentries to stand guard. It is useless to work so hard for a living, getting up early and going to bed late, for the Lord provides for those he loves while they are asleep. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a real blessing. The sons a man has when he is young are like arrows in a soldier's hand. Happy is the man who has many such arrows. He will never be defeated when he meets his enemies in the place of judgment. And in Mark chapter 12, verses 38 to 44, which can be found on page 64 in the New Testament, Mark 12, verse 38. As he taught them, he said, Watch out for the teachers of the law, who like to walk around in their long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplace, who choose the reserved seats in the synagogues and the best places at feasts. They take advantage of widows and rob them of their homes, and then make a show of saying long prayers. Their punishment will be all the worse. As Jesus sat near the temple treasury, he watched the people as they dropped in their money. Many rich men dropped in a lot of money. Then a poor widow came in and dropped in two little copper coins worth about a penny. He called his disciples together and said to them, I tell you that this poor widow put more in the offering box than all the others. For the others put in what they had to spare of their riches, but she, poor as she is, put in all she had. She gave all she had to live on. May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word, and to his name be the praise and glory, now and forevermore. Amen. And before we hear the message for this morning, we once again return to our hymn books to him 500. Lord of creation, to you be all praise.
If you have your Bibles with you, can I ask you please to turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, and to the reading from verse 38 to 44. Let us pray. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word, and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom and your will. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Last week, on Thursday the 21st of October, the 260th anniversary of the Battle of Trafalgar was celebrated. It was the Navy's most famous victory and confirmed our reign on the seas at that time. The date also marks Lord Nelson's death as he was fatally injured in the battle. The biographer of Lord Nelson describes him as an extraordinary figure by any standards. He has been regarded as the greatest officer in the history of the Royal Navy with Trafalgar seen as his greatest victory. Now, from a physical point of view, Noel Nelson was a small man. He was barely five foot six. He lost the use of one of his arms and also lost the sight of one eye. Tragically, of course, as we all know, he lost his life in the Battle of Trafalgar. He was fighting, of course, against the French and the Spanish Navy. Furthermore, the biographer referred to Lord Nelson, who, in a rather ruthless and brutal age, when life was cheap and especially military life was of little value, Nelson, however, managed to instill enormous respect from his naval officers and sailors. And the reason for this was more than just his military genius, but above all, because he had the common touch among his men. He had the ability to get on with an appeal to ordinary people. Now, I share this story because this morning, in our reading from Mark chapter 12, we haven't read it this morning, but if you go to verse 37, we read that referring to Jesus, and I quote, the people heard them with delight. They heard them gladly. The common people were joyful and rather eager to hear what Jesus had to say. And this was not surprising. For as Matthew chapter 7 verse 29 tells us, he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. But of course, not everyone did hear him with delight. In fact, the religious leaders had every reason to silence Jesus and to get rid of, which in fact they did just two or three days later on Friday, Good Friday. You see, this was the last week of Jesus' life when this story was told. It was the last days of his life. On this particular day, likely to be Tuesday, it had been a rather eventful and demanding day for Jesus and his disciples. Having returned, this is for the third time, to the temple in Jerusalem with the disciples, Jesus had 
dealt with severe confrontations with the religious leaders on that particular time. First, we are told that he was challenged regarding his authority. Who is he thinks he is? Kind of way of thinking. Furthermore, the Pharisees and the Herodians sought to trap him with a question about paying taxes. This attack was followed immediately by the Sadducees, raising a question concerning his teaching on the resurrection. And finally, one of the scribes, the legal, the lawyers of the law, asked Jesus about the great commandment. What is it? Now, I am sure that having dealt with this onslaught of antagonism, Jesus must have felt rather tired, don't you think? Exhausted, mentally drained, and dare say even frustrated with the attitude and the accusations of those who clearly wanted to undermine his authority, credibility, and doing him harm which they did. And so finding a moment of reprieve, we find Jesus here in this story seated within the temple courts near the treasury. This will prove to be a rather important moment for the disciples and for all of us, all of us, who call themselves Christians. A valuable lesson is going to be taught to them and to all of us ever since. A lesson brought about by the example of a rather insignificant widow. The example of a poor widow and her little small gift. She will become an example for all of us. And the fact that today, over 2,000 years later, we still remember her and we still talk about her highlights what really we need to learn about this. You see, at face value, the widow's offering is a story seemingly about money. And it is. Because money is involved, isn't it? But it is more than that. Much more than that. There is two things I want to highlight this morning as we reflect on this theme of Give Sunday. And the first thing I want us to remember and to understand is that Jesus sees everything. Jesus sees everything. Here we find Jesus looking, observing everything and everyone. As he is sitting near the wall of the court of the women. That's why this widow is there. The court of the women. He observes certain wealthy individuals giving of their substance into the temple treasure. Thirteen brass vessels shaped like trumpets. Rather substantial in size. Were in place so that worshippers would contribute to the treasury of the temple. Each of these containers would have had an inscription that revealed the purpose of the gift and where it was to designate within the offering. Nine of these containers were for legal use. It was a kind of a tax. In those days, everyone had to contribute for the upkeep of the temple. In some ways, 
Maybe some of us would think maybe that would be something rather nice for the church. But of course, I can imagine the condescending and indeed the accusations. The church is only interested in money. And under normal situations, I suppose we have to talk about money because that is part of our gift to God. In those days, it was a legal requirement. No ifs, no buts. It was compulsory for the upkeep and the maintenance of the temple. But then there were four other, four other containers which were actually described for voluntary offerings. And Jesus was observing everything and everyone. First, he noticed how rich people are putting large sums. No checks, of course. No credit cards. No paper coinage. You could not only see it, but you could certainly hear it making the noise on the way down. Perhaps some of them wish that it did as much noise as possible. So that everyone would know that they were there giving plenty. Maybe they were the platinum classes of givers in the temple. The very wealthy indeed. In any case, Jesus did know. Because he sees everything. He did see who these people were. He also knew how much they gave. But now, as Jesus continues to watch those who cast their money into the brass containers, something unique caught his eye. What a wonderful, what a wonderful thing this is. A poor widow came into the trash into the treasury, throwing in two small copper coins, just two, little ones, very light in weight, very small in size. Clearly she was destitute, living in extreme poverty. And while Jesus had noticed many rich people cast in their offering, this widow caught the attention of Jesus because she was going to be the object lesson for all the disciples. And my friends, the object lesson to you and to me this morning. She is. The mites she gave were the smallest of Jewish currency and of very little value. But Jesus saw what this woman gave. Oh, yes. He did. And I want us to consider the significance of the background to this woman. We don't know her name. We just know that she was a widow. And throughout the period of both the Old Testament and the New Testament, it was enormously difficult to be a widow. Let me remind you of that. There was no pension, no government support, no social security. In fact, widows were very often not just extremely poor, but also utterly dependent on the generosity of others. They were forced to become beggars. They would more than likely work from dawn to dusk, trying to earn a living just to survive. We know the story from Naomi and Ruth and the gleaning in the fields and so on. Is there an example of what that meant? There might have been some who were well provided for, but the majority did not have anyone to care for them. And this poor widow certainly was one of them open to abuse and exploitation. And as we read in verse 40 here, where certain people who devour with widows 
houses and for a pretense make long prayers. In other words, it was hard enough to be poor. Don't you think? It was hard enough not to have very much to survive. But even the very little that they have, very often, these people became prey to the establishment. The religious scribes, the, the lawyers of the law, the experts of the Jewish law acted both as lawyers and theologians, assisting people with financial as well as spiritual affairs. It reminds me how in the days of the Reformation, the indulgences, when the Catholic Church wanted to build St. Peter, and they were selling indulgences, pieces of paper for people to give as much as they could so that their loved ones would be relieved from purgatory. Give as much as you want so that your father and mother will be released from their torment. This is a classical example of abuse of something that clearly was not scriptural, never has Never will be. That's why we had the Reformation. Thank goodness for that. But the Sadducees, they were doing it even then. They will lose long prayers, give them a reputation for piety, which made it easy for them to take advantage of innocent people, including widows. In fact, the first century historian Josephus reports shocking behavior on the part of some religious leaders, some of whom used henchmen, ruthless and unscrupulous men who basically came knocking. It's like debt collectors, by the way. Nevertheless, in spite of her difficulty, there she is. Don't you wish that you... I'm sure we are going to meet her in heaven. It's one, of the, it's one of the people I'm looking forward to say hello to. Because this woman, there she is, quietly and humbly. Perhaps in her threadbare clothes, she gives two small copper coins. No much noise, I hasten to add. As the coins went down the brass containers, no one noticed that she was there, never mind her small gift. But guess what? Jesus saw it. He always does. He took note of it. And my friends, this is a humbling reminder to all of us here today. And I hope to all our friends and brothers and sisters who will be listening to this service online later on. To you too. To all of us here today. This is... A significant reminder that regardless our financial difficulties or stresses which life brings upon us, nothing goes unnoticed before the eyes of Christ. Our giving, as everything else, is always done in the sight of God. Everything we do, whether in thought, word, or deed is done in the eyes of Christ. There is nothing hidden from him. He sees everything. He knows everything. He knows you. And he knows me. But secondly, Jesus not only saw what she gave, but more importantly, he saw her heart. He saw her motives. He saw the intentions. He saw the emotions. The main reason why she gave these little copper coins. He saw her dedication and affection. And what was it that moved her to give? Love for God. Her love for him. Does that not stare your heart? It certainly stares mine. 
Do I need to mention this? Money and love together. Some say, well, says, be here, Benjamin, for goodness sake. But I must. I must. Because the Bible says so. And because Jesus is teaching us this lesson here today from this widow, this poor widow. You see, it's not difficult to give 10% as the Bible teaches, which is called tithing. 10% of all your income. It's very easy to give that if you have plenty to do it. That's not difficult to do because we don't need a great deal of money to live and survive and have fulfilling lives. But this poor widow, she gives everything. She is giving everything she had. She had no savings, no pensions, no investments, no guarantees, no bank balances. In fact, probably the following day she will rise early in the morning and will try to find some money just to survive. My friends, this poor widow gives everything she had. Of all the people in the world, she had the perfect excuse to say, well, what possible good are my two small copper coins? In, today, in today's money, and I haven't said that until now, but in, in today's money, her two small copper coins would be worth about two five pence. Two five Pence. What is 10 pence after all? What possible effect is to 10 pence going to have on this palatial temple of Herod? Would the temple treasury have missed 10 pence? I would like to think not. Of course, if you ask me, she had every reason and every excuse, every justification for saying, I can't give anything. She could have observed the wealthy people with their vast amounts and thinking it made little impact on the style of their lives. For them, it certainly was not a issue. It wasn't a sacrifice for them. It cost them very little. We wouldn't blame her if she would have thought that. If she would have reasoned, well, God doesn't expect me to give that which I depend on for survival. And you know what? Essentially, he wouldn't. God doesn't need anything from anyone. He owns everything. What possible motive then did she have in giving her two small copper coins? And the answer is, my friends, she gave because she loved God. That's it. She loved him. She seems to be bursting with love for God as she enters the court of women. I want you to have everything, she would have said to him. Lord, have everything. This is what I have, but I'm giving it to, to you. And guess what? Jesus saw that and he commands it. Listen to what he says in verse 43. And 44. This is what he said to them, to the disciples. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, As surely I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they all put out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put all that she had. Her whole livelihood. It reminds me of the words of the hymn by Isaac Watts. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I can but loss and poor content on all my pride. Where every realm of nature mind my gift would still be far too small. Love so amazing 
so divine, demands my soul, my life, and my all. As I come to the end of this story this morning and its important lessons, I want to just conclude by giving you a story. Now, I'm reminded of a story which I have no means of confirming whether it is true or not. I think it is, but I cannot verify it. Of a little girl who one Sunday went to church with her parents and when the offering plate came around, she put on her doll and cherished little doll onto the offering plate. This was the doll that she took to bed with her at night and the doll that got up in the morning and the doll that she carried around under her arm. It was really her treasure. But on this Sunday she decided to put it into the offering plate as it went round. Of course the church elders we are very touched by this. And notifying the minister of what actually had taken place, during the week the minister visited the family and he brought with him the doll. And calling to the little girl, she says, Look, I am giving you your doll back so that you can enjoy it and have many happy times with it again. To which the little girl, wiping a tear from her eye, shakes her head and says, No. And when the minister asked why, she replied, I didn't give my doll to you, I gave the doll to God. The lesson from both this story, I believe, and of this poor little widow, it is simply this, that God knows everything about us. He knew about this poor widow. He knew why she gave. But the most important thing, she knew why. He knew why. I know it is difficult when we face adversity in life, especially financial hardship, I know. But we must learn, I believe, in the midst of all the challenges that clearly we are going through, to trust in the Lord and be confident that he will provide. He always does. He is debtor to no man. Or woman. The Lord will honour our faithfulness. We must learn in faith, in faith to serve him and to trust him. And I know, as our, our treasurer Alistair has rightly reminded us all, at present, as a congregation, we have a financial challenge due to the consequences of COVID and the many property repairs and upkeep that we must carry it out and hopefully improve in the coming years. But God knows and he sees. Let us make sure that as we reflect on this lovely story, that we will know why we serve and why we give. And whatever we do, let us do so as our gift of love for God, as Christ himself gave himself to us. Remember, three days later, Jesus would die on the cross. He gave everything. He gave himself. He gave his life for you and me. May God give us understanding and help us to do the same and do it gladly. And to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. Let us pray. Our faithful God, we want to give you thanks this morning. We want to give you thanks for the life that reminds us so much about giving, but also giving with the right heart as loving you. Lord, we pray that you will take our lives, our gifts, great and small, as we offer them to you, as we give them to you in love, and commitment. This morning, gracious Father, we pray for the needs of our church, both physical and spiritual. We pray for our members, we pray for our, our friends, those that support us, those that pray for us, those that come to church, 
those who are here today and those father who may not be able to join us but we know father they listen to us online we pray for those who are sad we pray for those heavenly father who need our prayers because of loneliness may on this national given day may our time our talents our faith our money be used father for your kingdom for the blessing of your people and indeed for the blessing of the parish in which we serve hear our prayers loving father as we commit all these things to you in faith through christ our lord we pray amen and so we come to the end of our service this morning and our final hymn is a very familiar one which i'm sure that you will recognize is why 153 great is thy faith God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the source of all goodness and growth, pour his blessing upon all things created and upon you, his children, that you may use his gifts to his glory and the welfare of all peoples. Go in peace to serve the Lord with joy and faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always.